Greetings on this third Sunday of Lent, in which we now encounter three Jehanine texts in Lent 3, 4, and 5 that come out of the ancient, ancient lectionary. Now, many of you know that Lent was primarily a baptismal season, preparing the catechumens who were unbaptized to be received into the church through baptism and the Lord's Supper during the Paschal Vigil, the Easter Vigil. And when they were preparing these catechumens, sometimes it was for a very long time, in these final stages, as they move towards the font, there was a desire to make sure that they had not encountered or were still lingering in the dark world with Satan, with, with things that had happened to them perhaps in their past that would make it difficult for them to experience this incandescent holiness that they would experience in the waters of holy baptism. I think we're not as aware of how uh, palpable Satan was in the ancient world. And what they did in the third, fourth, and fifth Sundays of Lent is that they, they underwent for the catechumens what they called the scrutinies, where they would literally scrutinize their lives as to how they might have engaged with Satan during the course of their lives if they had been uh, particularly, and this is how Satan works as you know, if they had been sinned against, especially sexually, if they had some shame that they were carrying. Uh, the scrutinies are all about shame and uncovering shame. It's an honor and shame sort of thing. And, and one of the, the great um, parts of this is that, that they would really um, focus in on that person. And, and in many ways, this was done sort of publicly, not so that everybody could hear it, but it would be done within the context of the liturgy. Um, they, there were scrutiny prayers. Um, there, were, there were ways in which they had a, the, their, their sponsor and then the bishop pray over them. There were exorcisms. And then in the fifth Sunday of Lent, they were given the creed to, to, to memorize because they were going to confess that now as the baptized, the Lord's Prayer, because when they come out of the font, they will pray the Lord's Prayer, because now they know who their father is, Galatians 4, Abba, Father. And then they were given the, 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 the gospel, so to speak. Now, this obviously is only at a point where they are able to, um, to hear the gospel in a particular way. Uh, they, they didn't have the text, but they were sort of given the gospels as this is your story, this is your life. Now, they're hearing the gospel, but, but the, the Gospels, in a sense, were given to them as the catechumens in, in their, their teaching for the last final <clears throat> weeks of Lent. Now, John 4, John 9, and John 11. The, this first one, of course, is the woman at the well. And it's, it's a, the Samaritan woman. It's a very important way to think about baptism. Jesus, the living water. Jesus is the one that we worship in spirit and truth. You know, and what is the true water? We're going to look at some of the themes here. Um, John 9, of course, is the man born blind and, and how blindness is, is uh, <clears throat> a synonym for the, the darkness that the scrutinies are trying to uncover. People are living in this darkness and now they can see, you know, through the waters of holy baptism. And then, of course, Lazarus and the resurrection. I mean, those are huge themes that clearly are not just paschal themes, but very much baptismal themes. I'm going to be with you for these three weeks. I just did a conference in southern Indiana on these texts. I've always been very interested in these texts. I helped advise a, a PhD thesis on these texts. Not advise, I was a reader. But anyway, th these, are, these have always been very, very important texts to me, even though I'm not a Jehanine guy. Um, we now have the Weinrich commentary, so I will commend that to you if you have the stamina to read uh, the, the whole thing, and I, I highly recommend that you do for John 4. And then in the other texts, it's going to be a little bit more difficult uh, to, to recommend a commentary. I, I use C.K. Barrett. I think he is a standard guy. He's a friend of my doctoral father's. I knew him, met him when I was at Durham. He's a Durham theologian. Um, my doctoral father did a, a commentary on John, and if you can get a hold of it, John McHugh, he's got a wonderful way of, of th thinking about this, that this Samaritan woman 
is now the bride of Christ, so to speak. And I, I really love that, especially with all the, <coughs> the husbands she's had. But anyway, let, let's just look at the text, and I just, I just want to look at it in a cursory way, uh, just to give you some of the, the things that you might want to preach about. Obviously, it's too long a text to preach on the whole text. You could just do the short part, 5 to 26, but I think you miss a lot. I think you're going to obviously have to, 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 to preach on this in a, in, a, in a larger thematic way. Um, I've highlighted, because I, I went through this whole text for three or four hours with this, th this text and the other text, for three or four hours with, the, with the, um, the circuit in southern Indiana, the Louisville circuit. Um, and, and I, you know, I highlight things that I think are interesting, obviously water. I, I always highlight titles for Jesus. I put those in blue. Notice the Samaritan woman, you know, is how, how often Samaria is listed. Um, we do have the setting. That, that this is typical of most pericopes, Jacob's well, which I think is a very important thing here. Um, then th this is a, a frame, a, a bookend. We have the Samaritan woman coming and the disciples leaving here at the beginning. And then at the end, the Samaritan woman leaves and disciples come. And the question is put on the table about water, you know, and Jesus asking, give me something to drink. Now, that obviously launches us into the first great discourse here, and there are two of them. This one is, of course, on the living water. And I put in green all the references to drinking, you know. Um, and it, 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 this, this statement in 10, if, the gift of God, I think this is a turning point um, in, in this text, um, who it is that you're speaking to. I mean, in a way, it's uncovering who this person is. Now, I, I, I highlighted Kyrie here. Normally, it's translated sir, you know, but we have, when we see it, we think Yahweh, you know. Um, you know, and, and, and just the notion here of, of our father Jacob, you know, the, the patriarchal character of this. I think it's, it's quite remarkable. And then in verse 15 here, we have the woman asking for something to drink, you know. Now, I, I think that is certainly a, a climax, and it brings this section on the living water to, to an end. But notice, give to me this water, and it is an echo of Jesus, give to me something to drink there in, uh, in verse 10, you know. So I, you, you, you see that he asks, and then through the course of her encounter with him, she asks him for this water. That, that is the living water, the water that, that wells up for eternal life, as you see there in verse 14. That, that obviously is a very important passage. Everything I put in blue I think of as a sort of gospel language. Then this very difficult and I think misunderstood passage on, on worshiping in spirit and in truth. Um, notice here that... The, the language here of Lord, again, you wonder if that is, is beginning to change for her, uh, that he's a prophet, the, the whole sense of the prophet Christology of, um, of, of the Gospels is there. Are you a prophet? Um, then the discussion there of, of where is the true place of worship, you know, and the, the, con the, the Jerusalem temple and the Samaritan temple. Um, this is the first time we see, and I put it in yellow, you'll see it at the end, the language of faith, you know, um, and it's going to come in gangbusters at the end. But, but you can see that that is what he is leading to, her to. And remember, faith is communion with Christ. That's what faith is. And, and to, to drink the water, to, to be incorporated in by, by a means, to drink the water that wells up to eternal life. Um, and then I put it in green here, the language of spirit and truth. Now, I, I think this has been just so misinterpreted over the years. Back during the worship wars, I had to deal with this, and um, you know, people would always appeal to this as a way of sort of loosing ourselves from any kind of historic liturgy or any kind of tradition, that, it's the, that this is the, the spirit and the truth is something that is sort of this free inward worship that we do. I was very interested 
in how Weinrich understood these things. And his, I'll, I'll let you read him, but what really struck me, and I, this is the way, of course, I've always understood it, and I think most of us have understood it. He said that spirit and truth must be capitalized because they are a reference to Christ. These are, this, the worship in spirit is worship in Jesus because Jesus and the spirit are never separated. So to worship in spirit is to worship, is, it's Christological worship. And of course, we know in John's gospel that Jesus is the one who speaks of himself as the way, the truth, and the life. And notice the, in verse 24 here, it is necessary to worship in spirit and truth. That is, to worship Christologically. Now, I don't know how you cannot see that in this text. This text is all about who Jesus is as the Messiah, as we're going to see at the very end uh, of this particular section right here now in 25 and 26. Now, I think this is a, a bookend to 410 where you can see her asking uh, him, him um, her asking, give to me to drink. And I, and I think it's very important to see that, that here he now um, is identified by her as the Christ, and you have Messiah Christ, and then Jesus describing himself as ego eimi, the I am. Now, if, if we have any doubts about who he is, uh, here it is. And, and in many ways, this is the great climax of this text. Although, we might want to suggest that the very end, when the Samaritans confess Jesus as the Savior of the world, that is the climax of the text. Um, oh, hold on here. Now, the next part here is where she leaves... Here we go, the transition. The disciples return, and she leaves. And um, here you can see one other title, the Christ, you know. And the works of God, uh, doing the works of God, um, all, all things, as many as you're doing. Um, th this is a very important moment here where th you can see that, that her understanding of who Jesus is is going beyond her. Um, and you can see that the disciples here are finally beginning to recognize um, that, that she is a significant uh, part of the mission of the church. And I think there's a, a deeply miss missional dimension to this. Now, if you think of this in terms of the scrutinies, the Samaritans were considered to be you know, just not simply non-Jews, but maybe even flirting with the darker world. And Jesus is entering that world and inviting them to partake of this living water. Um, the fact that it does extend beyond her is really the last part of this text, where the Samaritans arrive and confess that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And here you can see the language of believing, the great language of remaining, which is Jehanine language for communion with Christ. And then the final thing of this text is this incredible title that they confess him as the Savior of the world. So think of, of how we have moved to this point through this text, and that somebody who is coming to baptism, you know, who is coming out of the dark world and is, is looking for this, this new life in Christ, you know, and has been catechized, but not yet baptized, and yet may have entered into the darkness, had been like this Samaritan woman, you know, somebody who was a great sinner with all these husbands, um, that these people now are coming to Christ and they're seeing him um, as the one who is, is going to take away their shame, that he is going to wash them clean by giving them wa living water that wells up into eternal life that Jesus is in fact the water of life and that he refreshes and he renews them so that, you know, the, the impulse of somebody who had such a dark and, and really sort of, sort of tragic life, this woman with all these husbands, she, she not only recognizes who Jesus is, but she brings others to come and see him so that they might confess him as the Savior of the world. So as we begin these three weeks, 
And, and I, I know these texts are long and it's going to be very difficult to sort your way through. But I think if you have the overarching theme of the scrutinies and how you're, you're beginning to under, undercover what it is about our life that is dark and how Christ is the light of the world and that light is going to shine on Easter morn, I think there you have the theme that will take you through John 4, John 9, and John 11. And I think it can be a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, I didn't mention this, but they have been preserved by the three-year lectionary here in Series A. This is not true of Series B and not true of Series C. If you did the catechumenate like some do, um, you might want to use these every year if you have catechumens who are moving forward. I know that's what they do in some churches. But uh, anyway, th th this is a great opportunity to, to do a big chunk of John 9 and to really kind of tell the story of what it is that Jesus does in John's gospel to bring us to the Paschal mystery, to celebrate the triumph of Christ, the light of the world.